So guys, today I'm going to be mixing up a little bit, and today I'm going to be talking about the seven survival slash kind of bushcraft lessons I've learned from my years of bushcraft survival outdoor practice in Alaska. So let's get started. So the first one, and one of the first ones I really learned as being super important, as you guys can probably well imagine, in Alaska is layering or protection from the cold. Because, you know, this year alone, it's already hit 50 below so understanding that there up here it gets really cold and how to properly protect yourself from that cold using things like shelters or properly layering your body to you know keep yourself warm but not overheat uh, was a very important lesson and something that my friend and I when we were first getting into bushcraft and survival we would go out on like 20 below days test our gear you know make sure we understood you know how fast you can lose heat how to retain heat how to make fire in the extreme cold and overall just how to function in that type of environment so that was the first lesson in survival slash bushcraft that was really important for me to learn another thing it would become really important to learn Learn that as well for things like bushcraft because if you guys notice I don't go out when it's really really cold uh, to bushcraft and that's because essentially when you're out at 20 or 30 below you are strictly contingent off of like fires like you have to move from one fire to the next fire because fires are super important for retaining your heat at those cold temperatures so another one that's in a way kind of similar is bug protection and while this one's more summer related up here in Alaska unlike a lot of the lower 48 states States, we do not spray or control bug populations at all up here which is generally okay because we really don't have that many different types of bugs or bugs that are bad but we do have a horrible mosquito problem and one of the things that's really bad about being out in the woods especially woods that are really kind of swampy or more tundra like that are really marshy is that there are loads of woods mosquitoes and woods mosquitoes that's kind of what I call them are different from city mosquitoes because city mosquitoes they tend to get a lot of blood so they're really not that bloodthirsty but when you go into the woods they are extremely bloodthirsty and so you really have to learn how to protect yourself and if you guys go and watch some of my summer videos you'll notice how covered up I am even for it being like 70 or 80 above I'm still very covered up and that's because the mosquitoes I remember one time when I was walking through the woods I was actually coming back from one of my bushcrafting trips and I turned around and there was this black cloud of mosquitoes and it was just horrible I mean there was it was quite large and all of this just cloud of mosquitoes was following me out of the woods and it's terrible they like I said particularly the woods mosquitoes are the worst because they don't really see a lot of animals or anything really so they're extremely bloodthirsty creatures and they will chase you down and just be so vicious and not only that they'll also smell you out or they'll like they can sense you from really far away and they'll come to you and like I said they do not stop you know uh, even wearing DEET like some of them will smell like right through your low, lower levels of DEET they like 30% they can still smell right through it because they are like so bloodthirsty so anyways uh, being properly protected against bugs and the largest thing you can do against them at least through what I found is just to wear the proper clothes clothes that still allow your body to breathe but clothes that don't allow the mosquitoes to come in because like I said when you're dealing with things like woods mosquitoes you can have DEET or you can have some kind of citrus whatever you know spray that makes them not want to come after you and that'll work for a little while and that'll work on some mosquitoes but overall it will not stop all mosquitoes and like I said especially the really bloodthirsty ones they will smell right through it the next one is also another summer one and it is smoke or wildfires like how to deal with wildfires and up here in Alaska once again I think this is something that more of my Southern California guys will understand because I think you guys get a lot of wildfires as well but up here in Central Alaska and really all throughout the central to lower Alaska we get a lot of wildfires especially and if it's a dry year because it seems like if it's a wet year we get a lot of mosquitoes and if it's a dry year we'll get a lot of wildfires so it's important to know how to deal with both of them and actually my personal experience with it was really I was glad because when I first uh, my first really experience with smoke I was just out bushcrafting and then all of a sudden it just rolled in like a thick uh, heavy set smoke from wildfires 
wildfires just rolled in and luckily like I said I had a bandana to put on but it's really important to know how to deal with smoke and to know or to have something some kind of respiration gear so that you can move away from the smoke because while I knew where this wildfire was and I knew it wasn't going to move toward me when you're in the middle of nowhere or you don't know about that wildfire the last thing you want to do is just try and wait it out and then see that it's actually coming right towards you you know so being able to move you know in a smoky environment is very important and that's something that maybe or you know that not a lot of people factor but you know we carry quite a bit of gear and I know for myself you know I can work up quite a breath you know breathing heavily uh, even in a smoky environment and it is very hard to move breathing heavily in a smoky environment so having some sort of respiration to account for that is very important this one is pack weight and this kind of gets back to winter and pack weight I really learned quite fast to pack light and this is very important because in Alaska and I'm sure some of you upper lower 48 people can understand where I'm going with or understand where I'm coming at with this and that is that when we get snow up here because our winters are pretty much entirely under uh, under 32 above or that's the freezing temperature when we get snow it sticks so we can get you know four feet of snow just as much as many of you guys in lower 48 but the difference is our snow is actually sticks our snow never goes away until springtime so we can literally have four feet of snow really have up to three and a half feet of snow on the ground and so learning to pack light is really important because even if you use snowshoes which I've already used a bit this year uh, packing heavy you will still sink down because it's just a matter of weight I mean the snowshoe will disperse your weight across a larger area but if you still weigh a lot or if you're still packing in a lot of weight you're still gonna sink through the snow. So learning to pack light, especially in the winter, was very important for not sinking into the snow. Uh, in addition, it also means that you don't fatigue as easily, but also here in Alaska, it's very mountainous. If you guys ever come here, or if you ever go onto a lot of the trails here, you'll know that a lot of it's very up, up mountains, down mountains, and learning to pack light is very important because going up mountains with heavy packs is a nice Nightmare. It's not fun at all. So learning to pack light was something that I learned quite fast and learning how to really make what you have count just so that you don't have to pack a lot of excess garbage with you. And the next one is alone and this one I'm not talking about the TV show but I'm talking about a very truthful fact about Alaska and this is something that's unlike any lower 48 state that really has to or you guys don't really have to deal with this in the lower 48 states but up here in Alaska you can truly be alone and this is a blessing and a curse in a way uh, it is nice and you guys will notice in a lot of my videos you know I'm not really interrupted and I don't really have interruptions and so it's really nice being able to be alone like truly going away from civilization and not being pestered by anyone you know it allows you to be really you know to do videos really well and to test gear you know and the privacy factor is really nice but on a downside to being truly alone is should you ever go missing or should anyone ever have to look for you it can be very difficult because now instead of you know the police or the you know state troopers having to search you know 20 acres they now have to search 200 or 400 acres for you and that's a very common thing and that's in fact how most people here in Alaska die is that the state troopers or the search and rescue can't find them fast enough and so that is a huge problem and what I would recommend or what I've learned to really do understanding that you know being alone is a very real thing here is that you just have to pack extra provisions things like spot satellite communications you know just anything that you can use to communicate to GPS's or use to communicate to any outside source with uh, keeping those on you it's just so you can do that you know just as a fail safe kind of scenario because that's the last thing you really want to happen to you so that is definitely a very unique thing and something I've learned like I said I've learned to have to counter it um, 
part is animals and animals have been another th unique thing that I've had to really learn and up here in Alaska we have you know just on the whole fact of our climate being so different we have very different animals up here and so it's been very interesting to learn how to trap them and learn how to hunt them and as well as learn how to protect yourself from them. we have quite a few predators up here and a lot of the predators we have up here unfortunately can attack humans things like wolves wolverines bears you know black black bears, grizzly bears, brown bears, all those types of animals are known and have attacked humans and killed humans in the past. So definitely understanding self-protection from them. And the largest thing is avoidance. You know, I don't, you know, when you see these types of animals, you don't want to go near them. You want to try and avoid them unless you're actually hunting them, then you want to go for them. But, you know, generally you want to try and avoid these types of animals. And so it's been very interesting to know that like really in Alaska, when you're out in the woods, unlike in some other lower 48 states, you know, you are not the top of the food chain here. You know, I mean, even a bull moose could charge you and kill you, which has happened before as well. So you really are not at the top of the food chain in Alaska and you have to be very cautious and aware of that point and once again avoidance is the largest thing that you can do and at least what I've learned to do you know because I see or you guys see me carrying 22s very frequently and so you're like where's your self-protection against all these vicious animals my self-protection generally comes from the fact that when I see any of these vicious animals uh I just avoid them. You know, you see it and you just got to be very observant when you're walking through the woods. You know, you don't want to get 10 feet away from a grizzly bear. You know, you want to see it a couple hundred yards away and be like, okay, there's a grizzly bear. I'm not going to go in that direction. What a lot of problem happens is when people act stupid or they don't, you know, see these animals and they end up getting, you know, 10, 15 yards away from a grizzly bear. And at that point, the grizzly bear can easily charge you and overtake you. So that is a very important thing to note. And uh, that's kind of how I've always treated the more dangerous animals here. In addition with animals of huntable things, things like squirrels and hares, it's been another very interesting lesson learned because here we don't have as many fatty animals, if any fatty animals. Uh, so having to make up for those fats because you can consume so much protein uh, you know, if you just like eat only hairs, you can consume so much protein that your body will actually go into shock because it's not getting enough fat. So it's, it's really interesting to learn the different native ways uh, of how the native peoples dealt with these kinds of things, especially in winter, because our winters, once again, are very So now brutal. going into taiga. This kind of transitions over into taiga, and taiga is the boreal forest, which is primarily what uh, central or the interior Alaska is made out of. Of course, there are multiple other environments in Alaska, but where I'm at, I'm in interior Alaska, and the interior of Alaska is primarily taiga. And taiga has been a very interesting place to see how things are done. Once again, it's very different to come up here and try and build things off of the land because like I'll just use bows as an example. Uh, you guys down in lower 48, you have things like Osage Orange or Hickory. I know Hickory is like all over the place, uh, but we do not have any hardwoods for making bows at all. So things like bows up here are very differently made and it's been very interesting to learn how things are done up here because they are quite different. And addition a lot of the uh, natural like I said uh, plants and berries and stuff that you guys have we do not have up here but we also have some berries that you guys don't have so it kind of bounces out but another thing that's interesting is our growing seasons our berry picking season lasts only about a month I mean maybe about two the very first berries you can really start getting are at the very tail end of July like July 30th 31st and it really only lasts till about September 1st to the around the first week in September is when the berries all start to die off. So you really have this very short window of pretty much August to get all your berry picking done. And then you have some access to things, uh, some natural plants throughout those summer months. But once again, our summer months are from about May to right around August. Middle of August is when our uh, season starts to transition into fall. So we really have a very short summer slash fall season to get everything we need done as far as plants go. And then after that, you know, you either have to collect enough berries that you can live off of them for the rest of the winter, or you have to turn to hunting and trapping. So 
that and fishing. Fishing's really big, just not in Fairbanks, but um, it's been very interesting to see how differential it is. And this has taught me to be, you know, a lot more on the ball and about getting things like berries and where to find them, how to get them. Another advantage we kind of do have as well here is since it does get and pretty much stay below freezing pretty much all of winter, another thing that we have access to is essentially a freezer outside that lasts all winter. So things like preserving berries is a very real Thing that you can do because you can put them just outside you don't even have to bury them in snow if there is any snow because if it's below 32 the berries aren't going to rot or they're not going to go bad they're just going to freeze so you can really preserve things like animals or meat and you can really preserve berries and natural things uh, without having to salt them or without having to do any fancy preservatives you just throw it outside and it freezes so it's very interesting and once again a nice thing to have access to but in addition it kind of sucks because that means everything outside is below freezing so it has pluses and minuses so lastly and then those are my seven uh, lessons for survival so if all you wanted to know about was the seven lessons that's it you guys can go now but I did want to quickly talk about kind of the future and as I alluded to I've really only been talking about the seven things I've learned from the interior of Alaska but there are so many different parts of Alaska there are there's the rainforest down by Juneau, there's coastal areas by the Kenai, there's also Aleutian Islands, and of course the very known tundra and arctic up north. And I really want to, in these coming years, try and get to these different places. And above all, I want to see how I can actually learn to include some of you guys into these trips. Because I think it'd be really fun to take some of my most loyal subscribers and viewers and have them come along on these journeys. Because I can go to an island easily. And I can go record a video on an island and do it all fun and have all the fun. And just leave you guys with like a video of it. But I think it'd be really fun to take along like three of my most most loyal subscribers to these different islands and have them survive with me because that would be a lot more fun and you guys would get a personal story that you can tell to your people or you know whoever you know and you know you can get more than just a video out of this you can get the actual emotions the experience the fun the excitement the terror whatever happens you know you can get that out of it and I think it's a lot better journey when you can include people into that story you know instead of just making it all about yourself so in the future and I'm talking still probably about at least a year out I would like to definitely get down to some of the Aleutian Islands and uh, get over to like the rainforest and coastal area I'm not sure about the tu uh, the tundra and the Arctic because that place I mean I've flown over it and I've been into the Arctic and the tundra many times and it's a desolate place it it's not a fun place I mean like I said I've flown over it many times and I've always looked down from the plane I've been like man if I had to survive there I don't know what I would do because there's about like one tree and we're talking like a little wimpy 10 foot pine tree and that's like about one per every square mile okay maybe it's a little bit more populated than that but it is bad <laughs> it's about that bad and then a lot of it and I've flown around a lot in the Brooks Range area and that's a good chunk of the tundra and the Brooks Range I mean there are areas you can inhabit of the Brooks Range as different villages do but for the most part the Brooks Range is hardcore I mean the, there's mountains that are you know like this steep like I mean they're like just straight up like spikes from the ground they are and they're very rocky very unhospitable uh, so I don't know when I'm going to be doing the tundra. I would like to at some point in my life do some survival in the tundra. But the tundra, I mean, it's rough. It's very hard. Whereas I do think the uh, islands and stuff, those would actually just be really fun. And they wouldn't be as hard as it is up here. Because actually in the lower, more southern parts of Alaska, it doesn't actually get that cold. Uh, up here in Fairbanks is where you really start to get the Arctic temperatures. That's another thing about the Arctic is it gets even colder up there than it does here. So I mean if it's negative 50 to 60 here, you know we're talking negative 60 to 70, you know, up there. And uh, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. 
so anyways guys that's kind of a future update on what i want to begin to do in the future like i said that's still probably a year out because i have to kind of find out more how i can do that and how i can get down there and when i can get down there and then if i want to include any of you guys or if i can't include any of you guys how to get you guys down there as well so anyways guys that's kind of my survival tips or those are my survival tips and what i want to begin to do because i would love to do an update to this video in a few years once i've been to these different parts of alaska and you know what my takeaways are from the aleutian islands as opposed to the interior as opposed to the rainforest as opposed to the coast you know like because all these different places have very different lifestyles and that's what i really want to get towards so anyways guys don't forget to comment like share subscribe and i'm out